The Falcon and the Winter Soldier finds Sam and Bucky making some new friends while reconnecting with some old ones. And wouldn't you know it, John Walker's fugazi Captain America is getting in the middle of everything and just messing it all up. Directed by Carrie Scoglin, episode four has got fresh connections to all of the Captain America films, Black Panther, and Avengers Infinity War, plus who even is the power broker? And don't forget all of the Easter eggs we could dig up in this one. But before we get into all of that, I have to warn you, we are about to spoil every single thing that happened in this episode. So if you haven't seen it just yet, or if you just don't wanna know, now would be the perfect time to step into another room and redecorate while we sort things out. Stay there. Okay, now that we're past the spoiler warning, let's get right into that big shocking moment. John Walker is a super soldier now and, oh yeah, that's him killing a dude in public with the freaking shield. Yikes. Okay, hold up. That's a pretty striking image of blood on Cap's shield. So let's take a second to recap a little and uh, show how we got here. Picking up from episode three, Sam and Bucky are in Riga near the Baltic Sea. Now you'll recall that Ayo and the Dormelage are there too. That they are hot on the trail of the Flag Smashers, but Ayo is hot on their tail, as is John Walker Cap and Lamar Hoskins, which leads to direct confrontations more than once in this episode. It doesn't have to be a war, Carly. Sam and Bucky track down Carly Morgenthau at her funeral, and Sam knows that Carly and her band of terrorists are all super soldiers, so, yeah, he's not spoiling for a fight if he can avoid one. Enter John Walker, who literally woke up and chose violence. No patience for Sam's tactics, he and Battlestar bust right on in and try to arrest Carly, which as you might imagine, doesn't go too great. Oh, and did we mention that Carly has the super soldier vials on her person? Because she totally does, or at least she does before Zemo shoots her and then stomps on all of them. All of them, but this one. The one that John Walker sneakily tucked inside his cargo pants. The serum amplifies everything that is inside, so good becomes great, bad becomes worse. Back in Captain America, the first Avenger, Dr. Erskine reveals that the super soldier serum takes whatever qualities a person has and amplifies them. So what does it mean when one of your first acts after taking the serum is killing a guy with the edge of a shield? Sorry, I'm getting distracted. Here's how this all happened. The big super soldier confrontation at the end of the episode eventually takes a human toll when Lamar saves Walker from Carly. <laughs> R.I.P. to Battlestar. I guess this is what happens when regular humans fight with unhinged and untethered super soldiers. You die. Fueled by pure rage and the super soldier serum, Walker freaks out and chases down a flag smasher. Uh, it wasn't me. Walker isn't hearing any of it. He wants revenge and he gets it. Except all of this happened in broad daylight, in public. And just like in the real world, everyone who saw it pulled out their cell phones and recorded it and streamed it. So the world watched as Captain America brutally murdered a guy with the shield in a foreign country. Now, Steve Rogers killed people too, both in times of war and in times of what would eventually lead up to the Infinity War. But he never killed anyone with the shield and definitely never out of rage. Now this is how John Walker will lose the shield. We know that Sam and Bucky wind up with it from the shots in the trailers and after such a public act of brutality, it just confirms what all of us already knew about this man. He's not fit to wield the shield. So the question is, will the US government and the GRC force John Walker to give up the shield or will Bucky get his wish and he and Sam just take it from Walker themselves? Could you free him? Okay, Ayo and the Dora Milaje are pretty pissed with Bucky and Sam right now. How pissed? Uh, let's just say very pissed. Episode four opens on a flashback in Wakanda with Ayo reciting the Winter Soldier's words to him in a final cleansing act. Now in this moment, Bucky was freed and we learn that Ayo has pretty in-depth knowledge of what he went through and what makes him tick. And now she's in Riga and she and the rest of the Dora Milaje want Zemo. Now they haven't forgotten how he murdered King T'Chaka when he blew up the UN in Captain America Civil War. 
Bucky reasons that Zemo is useful and that he's ultimately just a means to an end. Io gives him eight hours. Now, after that, she and the rest of the Dormelage are coming for him. Now, as you might imagine, that eight hours disappears pretty much immediately. Now, they descend on Zemo's safe house in Riga just as John Walker showed up to run his mouth. Now, anyway, they all wind up fighting. The Dormelage makes everyone, including this fake Captain America, look like chumps before Io ends the fight by neutralizing Bucky in the most disrespectful way possible. But in doing all of this, Zemo has escaped and is now in the wind, and the Dormelage are not about to let that slide as Sam, Bucky, Walker, and Hoskins all turned their attention to the Flag Smashers in the episode's final act, we're left with the knowledge that Io and the Dora Milaje are heading off to hunt him. Now, how long can he evade them? Yes, he's a rich, evil mastermind, but can he stay one step ahead of the Black Panther's deadly bodyguards? Io deactivating Bucky's arm wasn't permanent and it didn't hurt him, so why did she do it? Now, this was Io's way of reminding Bucky that his whole new lease on life, including his vibranium arm, was given to him by the Wakandans, and when it's convenient for them, they can take it all back if he forces them to. It's the power broker. You play revolutionary on borrowed time, little girl. Once again, we do not get any kind of glimpse of the power broker in this episode, or do we? I mean, we don't even know if he is even a he at all. Whoever the power broker is, he's still sending threatening text messages to Carly Morgenthau and her Flag Smasher compatriots, and that's all the direct action the character takes in this episode, which leaves us all still wondering, who is the power broker? The Falcon and the Winter Soldier has two more episodes left before season end. Now, if WandaVision was any indication, it's super unlikely that Marvel is gonna spring any surprise characters on us this late in the game. So what I'm saying is, no, Mephisto is not secretly the power broker, y'all. So just stop with that, no. What's more likely is that A, the power broker will remain unidentified and will continue to be a problem in the MCU after this, or B, the real power broker has already been introduced to us. Drop it, Zemo. Suspect number one has to be Sharon Carter. Now, Sam has a quick phone call with Sharon in this episode. Now, she's back in Madripoor battening down the hatches as the power broker is super pissed that his super soldier serum got stolen and his employee of the month, um, stopped working unexpectedly. No! We still don't know for sure that Sharon isn't secretly the power broker and seeing as she is so clued into what's going on in Madripoor only seems to reinforce that. But is this just a misdirect? I mean, Sharon's a hero, right? Suspect number two. Well, Zemo, obviously. I mean, he has seemingly limitless resources and is crafty enough to get out of prison and escape the Dora Milaje without much trouble. Also, don't forget that he's been doing sketchy stuff ever since Bucky broke him out of prison. The Flag Smashers had leverage on the Power Broker when they had the last 20 doses of the serum on the planet. Now, there won't be any more doses because through careful and nuanced negotiation, Zemo was able to convince Nagel not to make more. And when Zemo encountered Carly Morgenthau in this episode, what did he do? Well, he tries to kill her and is at least able to destroy almost all of the Super Soldier Serum vials. If Zemo is somehow not the Power Broker, that means he's truly been on one mission this entire time. Super soldiers cannot be allowed to exist. And of course, we got a roundup of all the Easter eggs we found in this episode. And here's what we got. John Walker's killing blow at the end of the episode mirrors the move Steve Rogers used on Tony Stark in Captain America Civil War. <laughs> Walker and Battlestar crash through a door, guns ablazing, references that iconic shot from Captain America First Avenger when Cap and the Howling Commandos did the same thing. Walker goes rage mode and kills after losing someone close to him. Now this tracks with the comics when his parents were killed and he then turns murderous. That Dormelage member kicks up Cap's shield like Steve Rogers did after the elevator fight scene in Captain America The Winter Soldier. What's with all the knives? Walker has a good question during that final fight, but Bucky is too busy flipping his knife like he did back in Captain America The Winter Soldier. Now, what did you think of this episode? Should John Walker be permitted to remain Captain America after killing someone with his shield in broad daylight? Or was he justified? And for Pete's sake, who is the power broker? 
Let's hear your best theories in the comments section down below. Anyway, thanks for watching this episode of Cannon Fodder. And for more MCU, here's the real reason Falcon gave up the shield. And remember to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch. Now, Zemo, why don't you vibe us on out of here, man?